Students, it's great to have you here in this, my latest update on my never-ending lecture on nuclear chemistry. In this video and the ones that fall, I'll teach you guys about radioactivity, nuclear power, and how to raise the dead through song. But first, I'd like to begin by sharing you a hilarious chemistry cat from quickmeme.com. This one says, what do you call a goofy criminal? Silicon. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to share with you a magical molecule of the day from the American Chemical Society Molecule Portal. This one is atrazine. Atrazine, a widely used herbicide, was first described in 1960 in two Swiss patents. It's prepared from cyanuric chloride, a chemical that is also used to chlorinate swimming pools. It was first considered to be relatively non-toxic to humans and animals, but in the past decade, new toxicity studies in atrazine's persistence in groundwater caused it to be banned in the European Union. It is still used in the United States and numerous other countries. Recently, biologists showed that atrazine causes sex changes in frogs. Look, my grandpa said all the dinosaurs were girls. Amphibian DNA. What's that? Well, on the tour, the film said they used frog DNA to fill in the gene sequence gaps. They mutated the dinosaur genetic code blended it with that of frogs. Now, some West African frogs have been known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single sex environment. <laughs> Malcolm was right. Look. Life found a way. After today's lecture, which will cover sections 5 through 8 from chapter 21 of our text, you guys should be able to describe the theory behind and some uses of radio tracers in following chemical reactions and medical diagnostics, perform rudimentary calculations using Einstein's energy mass equation, or E equals mc squared, explain nuclear fission, how it works, what it does, and what it can be used for, be familiar with the pros and cons of electricity production through nuclear fission, explain what nuclear fusion is, how it works, and list its potential applications and detriments, and note that we will skip section 9. That's the lineup. Let's get started, beginning by the discussion of radio tracers. I'd first like to emphasize something by showing you a quick video. Next weekend, we're having our annual war games. Now, Simpson, because of your many years as a nuclear technician, we're putting you on a nuclear sub. Nuclear. It's pronounced nuclear. Oh, whatever. Nuclear. Why did I show you that? Because, of course, I want you, my students, to know how to pronounce nuclear correctly. It is not nuclear. It's nuclear because it has to do with the nucleus, not the nucleus. Okay, now let's take a look at what this picture is all about. According to our text, a variety of methods have been devised to detect emissions from radioactive substances. Henry Becquerel, shown here in this picture, discovered radioactivity because radiation caused fogging of photographic plates. Since that time, photographic plates and film have been used to detect radioactivity. Now, because radioisotopes can be detected readily, they can be used to follow an element through its chemical reactions. The incorporation of carbon atoms from CO2 into glucose during photosynthesis, for example, has been studied using CO2 that is enriched in carbon-14. In this equation, for example, you can see that if you have C14 labeled CO2 and you combine it with water in a plant that undergoes photosynthesis, it will produce C14 labeled glucose. That tells us then that the carbon atoms that are incorporated in a plant into glucose and the polymers that it makes therefrom arise from metabolizing CO2. And all this was able to be seen experimentally by labeling the CO2 with C14 instead of your typical C12. So the use of carbon-14 label provides direct experimental evidence that carbon dioxide in the environment is chemically converted to glucose in plants. Analogous labeling experiments using oxygen-18 show that the O2 produced during photosynthesis, this product over here, comes from water and does not come from the carbon dioxide. So yes, radio tracers are cool and useful. We'll now read a few words from the Chemistry and Life paragraph found on page 893 of our text. Radio tracers have found wide use as diagnostic tools in medicine. Table 21.6, shown below on this page, lists some radio tracers and their uses. These radioisotopes are incorporated into a compound that is administered to the patient, usually intravenously. The medical applications of radio tracers are further illustrated by positron emission tomography, or PET. PET is used for clinical diagnosis of many diseases. 
In this method, compounds containing radionuclides that decay by positron emission are injected into a patient. These compounds are chosen to enable researchers to monitor blood flow, oxygen and glucose metabolic rates, and other biological functions. Some of the most interesting work involves the study of the brain, which depends on glucose for most of its energy. Changes in how this sugar is metabolized or used by the brain may signal a disease such as cancer, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, or schizophrenia. My purpose in reading this, of course, is just to illustrate the fact that radio tracers have real-life applications. Now on to another subject, E equals mc squared, which is, of course, a famous equation devised by Einstein. Here's a picture of him when he was younger. <laughs> Now, energy and mass can be mathematically interrelated using this famous equation, where E stands for energy, M for mass, and C for the speed of light, which happens to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. This radical equation suggests that any time a process results in a change in mass, there's also an accompanying change in energy. In essence, theoretically, this shows that mass and energy can, in theory at least, be interconverted. As we see displayed on the synthesizer machines shown on Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> if you're old enough to have enjoyed that show like me. So why in the world don't we get to experience larger changes in energy when simple chemical reactions transpire? Well, the reason, according to our text at least, is that the mass change in chemical reactions are too small to detect. For example, the mass change associated with the combustion of one mole of methane gas, which is a very exothermic process, is negative 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 9th grams, which is a super tiny number. Now, Because the mass change is so small then, it is possible to treat chemical reactions as though mass is completely conserved. Now, in contrast, the mass change and the associated energy change in nuclear reactions are much greater. The mass change accompanying the radioactive decay of one mole of uranium-238, for example, is 50,000 times greater than that for the combustion of one mole of methane gas. For the following equation, the alpha decay of uranium-238 to thorium-234, for instance, the mass of the nuclei are uranium-238 being 238.0003 AMU, thorium-234 being 233.9942 AMU, and helium-4, the alpha particle, being 4.0015 AMU. The mass change, or delta M, is the total mass of the product minus the total mass of reactants which is this number plus that number, these are the products, masses together, minus the mass of the mole of reactants. That comes to be equal to this number, so that's an actual measurable mass change, 0 0.0046 grams. And although that still seems small, it's large enough you could measure it on a scale in the lab. Thus, the energy change for this reaction is E equals mc squared, or delta E being equal to delta mc squared, which is just c squared times delta m, or c squared times the change in mass, since c itself doesn't actually change, just m. If we throw in our numbers then, we're going to see that c, the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, is going to be squared here. We throw in for our delta m this negative 0 0.0046 grams, and then we convert it to kilograms as, as the SI unit. It ends up coming to this answer, which has a negative sign indicating that it's exothermic. Negative 4.1 times 10 to the 11th kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now please note that kilogram meter squared per second squared is the same thing as a joule. So this number is actually negative 4.1 times 10 to the 11th joules. We can see then that this nuclear reaction produces over 400 billion joules of energy per one mole of uranium. Is that a lot more than combusting methane gas? Oh yeah. The take home from this is that once again because of this equation, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, mathematically speaking, energy and mass are interconvertible. However, because the speed of light is such a large number and you're squaring that number, the amount of mass required to produce a tremendous amount of energy is very small. In converse, if you wanted to produce a large amount of mass, as they do on Star Trek The Next Generation when they just have these machines that make food from thin air, it would require a very humongous amount of energy. Make sense? Good. Let's go on by looking at a problem. When two atoms of hydrogen 2, formerly called deuterium, are fused to form one atom of helium 4, the total energy evolved is 3.83 times 10 to the negative 12th joules. What is the total change in mass in kilograms for this reaction, keeping in mind that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second? I'm not going to show you how to do this, but invite you to use this equation equals mc squared to see if you can come up with the answer on your own. 
That takes us to the end of this video. Please stay tuned to the next video in which I'll begin by teaching you about nuclear binding energies. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.